Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, despite of the uh, huge cough like the load and stuff. Um, we're going to continue on making a nice language. Yeah. So yeah, who remembers this from last one, uh, from last time? Uh, so we had we had sentences. They were kind of uh, they, they could be incomplete with variables, but if we you know match two sentences, we get a more complete sentence. Okay, who feels reminded? Uh, ah, kind of, kind of. Ah, okay. So yeah. Um, this is essentially like the, the basic mechanic. So um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, when, when we have when we have these two sentences, um, uh, but like for example, one, one sentence has here the, the x, where another sentence has something more at the position of the x, um, then uh, this is completed in here, and um, same for the y. So like at the position of the y, we complete it, and uh, this is how from from incomplete information we can derive a more complete sentence, uh, essentially. <clears throat> Okay, and um, yeah, uh, using roots, uh, we could make computation. Right? So <coughs> yeah, this thing is pronounced if. Um, so yeah, for example, when, when we have a go left in our memory, um, we also have to check that you know nothing goes right. Something um, just for uh, for vocabulary, um, I often call these things here. Uh, so the, the 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 right hand side of it constraints. Um, that is because. Essentially, that is what we you know what we're doing. Uh, we, we're saying that something something has to hold. So, like you know, this sentence needs to be part of our language, um, and, oops, uh, and it needs to be um, uh, yeah deducible by by um, merging the sentences that we um, that we already know to be true. And um, yeah, this is how we can uh, constrain uh, variables. Okay. Uh, Today's topic. Let's talk about of what we talk about, uh, <coughs> and uh, yeah, we, we do that on the following sentence: To fix my car, um, please hand me the monkey. Today's topic is about how do we like if we have a sentence, how do we check whether this sentence actually makes sense? Right? So whether the sentence actually does what we what we think it's going to do, and um, in order to do that, uh, yeah, let let's start small. Let's uh, let's start to assign some sense. To some of these parts. So, for example, to fit my, uh, if, I, if I want to fix my car, you know, at, at this part, um, I uh, need to put the brake of, you know, I, I obviously need a tool. I don't have to write that, but like, you know, from, from, from how we know how this is working, I need a tool. When I need a tool, I also know that this tool has to like somehow appear in mine, it will somehow appear somewhere else uh, in our sentence, right? Um, so, we also have like a, like a tool block. Um, so somewhere else, the meaning of a tool needs to appear in our sentence. <coughs> uh, so, uh, uh, we can also even say that we even know the position of where this is going to happen. Yeah? So if we, if we have, have a tool, you know, we then say, okay, this is, this is where I'm now uh, searching for a tool. Okay, now many people would say, uh, um, you bloody bastard, monkey is not a tool. Yeah? Uh, this would be in the human form of a type error. So, uh, <coughs> uh, hey. Yeah. So uh, if we, uh, yeah. So, so for example, uh, if if at the position where we were checking for a tool, there is no tool, then we get an error. <coughs> However, I would say, well, um, for me, a monkey is just not a tool yet. This could look something like this. So you know, at the position, it's you know, at, it's at least part of what we were we were searching for, but not its entirety. So. Um, if we have a smart tool now, uh, for example, our compiler could tell us now what we were meant to put in there. And then the sentence makes sense, to fix my car, please hand me the monkey wrench. <coughs> and this is the general idea of types. So we, we just you know, take parts of our sentence and assign them a certain meaning, and then we check whether the meaning checks out. And if in the end we can assign a meaning to everything and it all fits nicely together, this is when our code compiles. Huh? Um, in the, in, the, in the nice language that we had the last time, this kind of looks like this. So um, essentially, we just have a, have, a, have a predicate or a sentence that says, uh, you know, which things match to what meaning, kind of, right? Uh, <coughs> so we, we could match, for example, a monkey to being an animal. We could match monkey branch to being a tool. Um, and as we have this, this nice mechanic of incomplete information, we can even put variables in here. So had me, you know, some, some A. Could, for example, match to some meaning of me a, but these two a have to be the same thing, right? Um, so when I want something, I obviously 
you know, mean that I'm actually getting that thing. Yeah? Or here, um, we can even formulate rules on this. So um, something is is a uh, is a good uh, uh, is a successful transfer um, if the the k is something that needs something and the b is something that provides it essentially right uh, <coughs> so uh, yeah this this is this, these are examples of how we can formulate meaning in this and um, yeah such such a match mechanic works with the same language that we did before however many people call those things types. So let's see today what we can do with types. Um, one example that actually occurs in programming, uh, this is how we could define a list type. Huh? So we just say, okay, this is, this is an empty list. Uh, it's of just type some list uh, A, where A um, is, the, is essentially like the variable that says which types of things are in the, uh, in the list. Huh? And then we have like a list constructor um, uh, like this, this, uh, this colon here. That says okay, we can add one element to a list, right? And this is exactly, uh, exactly what we say. So if we have an element of, of the type A, uh, and the type A corresponds with the with the type of things that are in the list, um, uh, yeah, the whole thing becomes a list of type A as well. Like here. <coughs> um, yeah. So concretely, uh, how our type checking could, for example, work is that we say, well, uh, we have some A that is of type A. Imagine a character, for example, yeah? and then we build a list. Then we, we first check for the first thing. Yeah? So we, we, we first run into the, the, the first case. We check the A, okay, it's of type A, meaning that this rest list also has to be of the same type. So then we go into the recursion. Now know that this is of you know, type A or type char or whatever. We go into the recursion and check whether all the other elements also have the same type until we reach the last thing, and the last thing we say it can be whatever type, we don't quite care. Uh, and you know, then, then this checks out because you know, all the rest had, had a certain type. <coughs> More examples on this one, you know, uh, get first, so we have a list, we want the first element, uh, meaning that uh, the, the xs needs to be, uh, needs to be a list, uh, the y needs to be some kind of output type, uh, say for reverse, um, two types of this, uh, yeah. Um, essentially, this form what we what we formulated. So we have, uh, uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, there's uh, there's more ways of how to pronounce uh, this type thing because we don't want to constantly write type. It's, it just reads funny. So if we make a sentence from it, that's nice and readable. We could say it is a, you know, um, you know, something is a list, something is an a. Um, or what many languages do is they use either either single colon or double colon, but I'm using single colons for this, so like you know double colons uh, for this type of notation. So the double colon means nothing else but like is a uh, relation. Uh, you know, the, the, the same thing is a type. <coughs> the great aim, the great aim of types is that we explain the code within our code. So we have an annotation um, uh, to kind of uh, kind of say what what the type and what's not. And um, this gives our code, uh, yeah, this gives us a possibility um, to explain what we mean and give the compiler a chance to tell us when, uh, when we went wrong somewhere. <coughs> Let's look at, at, uh, at this example. So we, here we have a list type, or like, you know, we, we know how to, how to create a list type. We also know how to create a Boolean, uh, which just has two constructors, um, which are also just terms, essentially. Um, <coughs> Uh, it's a bit of a funny function, um, uh, so we, we're going to create a function that gives us the last element of a list. For now, it doesn't return the last element, but just a boolean. You will see in a second why um, why I do that. Um, but yeah, so essentially, either we find the last element or we recursively go uh, through the list until we find the last element, and then we have these type annotations, meaning okay, the first argument needs to be a list, the second argument needs to be a boolean. If we closely look at this, there's only a very small part that actually does computation. So, <coughs> if you write something like this, uh, that's what what your computer is actually supposed to be doing. Everything else just slows down your just slows down your computer. You see that with uh, with Python, Python uh, does these checks to uh, at runtime, and yeah, it, it makes a, it makes a code unnecessary. So, so yeah, in the ideal case, all this type stuff is being checked by your compiler. So that makes <coughs> The second big aim of types, yeah, uh, 
we, we impose certain, uh, certain properties, then I check the uh, compile time, and then we do not have any, any slack of um, doing runtime, but of course, still all right. Um, I personally, like this notion is an, actually a more general notion because we can technically say, well, our compiler should just throw out anything that, you know, that causes slack. So like any computation that we maybe formulate, but that doesn't do a whole lot, you know, can, can, just, can just be thrown out. Um, so what makes types special? Well, uh, in, in, in this notion, the only thing is that once we use a type annotation, we want our compiler to tell us when the compiler throws something out, right? So because sometimes we just want to make code nice, and then the compiler should just optimize it, and we don't need to know. But sometimes we, we want to say like, okay, if you um, if a certain constraint is not hit, please tell me. Right? <coughs> and um, yeah, this is this is what happened. What's happening here? So let's try actually creating an error by uh, flipping these two arguments. So we put a thing where you know it kind of doesn't belong. And um, yeah, the output here always is a boolean, and the uh, uh, and the, the input kind of uh, always is a list. So if we flip these two. The, the z here is constrained to be a boolean, but uh, you know all of these input values are constrained to be lists, right? So our our nice notion gives gives us these two these two things. Now, if this were a general predicate thing, what would be or like uh, if if the type invasion would behave like a general predicate or a general sentence? What would be the problem with this one? Uh, the main problem is that there is no problem. So in, in logical languages, um, it's perfectly possible um, when, when we just like have a constraint that like there's, there's several ways how to fulfill these constraints. But the special thing about types is, um, yeah, when we have that error, there can be only one type, right? So every, um, every part of our sentence has exactly one type that we, that we assign it to. And this is also what gives an error because then once these types differ, uh, we get an error and our compiler can tell us that we, we went wrong somewhere. <coughs> okay, let's look at the example and how it's meant to be. So, uh, the last function where we actually give out the last element. Um, and um, we do the very same error that we did before, so we just flip these two around. Um, yeah, so then we know, okay, like the... Um, the element needs to be of the type that the list is carrying, um, but when we put it into, into the input here, it also needs to be the it needs to be of the list type that we put in there. Um, can anyone already see what's the problem when we have these two at the same time? Are these two types different? They look pretty different, right? Um, let me show you something because uh, they technically aren't. Um, uh, yeah, in order to, to look at this example, look at, let's look at something that, that uh, looks like it makes a bit more sense. So, let's say from, from several parts of the code, one part of the code deduces that this is a tuple type, the first half contains a list, and, but it doesn't really know what the other half of the tuple contains. Some other part of the code now deduces the rest of it, so it deduces that in the second part of the, of the, um, of the type, it needs to be a list, but it doesn't know what's in the, uh, in the first type. Now, the Z only can have one type, but if we match these together, that perfectly fits, right? So our code still works if we then just say, well, you know, we complete the information and we get, uh, you know, a tuple of, of two lists of the same type. What happens now if we try to match these two? Pardon? It's not complete. Uh, it's not complete. In, in what sense, not complete? Um, the funny thing is, your compiler actually can make sense of this. What the compiler does is, okay, it says, well, the A needs to be assigned to list A. And then if we look at, okay, what is this? Well, this A, we have already assigned it to list A. To list A, to list A, to list A, to list A. So this is, you know, the type that your compiler would infer in this case, right? Kind of like this, this infinite list thingy. And the most funny thing I personally think is that um, there's not a whole lot of errors happening until it's very much too late. So, <coughs> uh, yeah, your function here, um, if we flip these arguments, would still perfectly type check because the compiler says, well, there is a type I can find that makes sense for this one. 
<coughs> and the only point at which this would crack is when you actually want to use this. So, uh, you know, at the point where we have, for example, a character list, you know, um, then this is a list of characters, and not a list, a list, a list, a list, a list. Right? So, only, only at this point is the first time where an actual error occurs. Right? Um, languages like Haskell, for example, don't allow these, these infant types because of that reason. Um, uh, I had a talk with a colleague, and in Akta, actually, you can formulate something like this. Um, you can't do a whole lot with it, but like, you can technically formulate it. But, <coughs> but yeah, essentially this error is caused by our compiler completing the notion of types that we already gave it. Sometimes we want that behavior. Uh, yeah, an, an example here, the append function, you know, we have two lists and we append it into the third list. Um, and, you know, we, we just kind of wrote that, but we, we don't really know what the compiler thinks that we are, that, that, that we are writing, you know? <clears throat> so what we can just do is, just like last time, we just ask the compiler, you know, we let these types um, be, uh, uh, be variables and ask the compiler um, to say us what the compiler thinks we've been written. And as we have uh, in our predicate language, like this back and forth reasoning, uh, the compiler actually can tell us uh, what it thinks that is the type. Does anybody have sometimes like this feeling that this compiler, like like that, that the compilers way more often know what to do with our code than we do ourselves? Um, it's often a problem in 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 C. Uh, so you write some code and your compiler does something completely different because of some special case that you hadn't got in mind. Um, with this notion, you can actually you know get a bit of a tool set of like looking into what the compiler thinks you wrote, right? Um, so yeah. Sometimes we want uh, we want these types to be inferred. In our example, though, uh, yeah, we weren't asking. So how do we get our compilers now to you know stop deducing stop deducing these types? <clears throat> and um, yeah, uh, an example here we, we have the, the head function. So we take the first element of a list. Uh, we can produce the same thing. So if we accidentally give out the rest of the list, we get this infinite type again. So one notion what we could do is just say, well, um, we, we, make it, we make an additional token that just says, don't match this type any further. Right? It's just a special thing. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, su such and similar tokens uh, are often called for all um, because it says like, well, list A is, the, um, is like the, the most general type. So like the, the list has to be in the type but then you cannot, like, it, it needs to work on whatever um, assignments we have for this A, you know? So we, uh, if we have, if we have this, this, this notion, the list, the list, the list, the list, list, this function only works on these super specialized lists. Um, but yeah, so here we would prevent uh, this list from, from further going down. The problem is now, um, we, can, we can state that, but now we can't really use it. Because every time we are using um, we are using our predicate, we are using it on something special. So we define it obviously for, you know, a general list A, but when we use it, we use it on a concrete list character, on a concrete list of strings or something else, right? So, um, yeah, this is why uh, today we will be using uh, some notion like this. This is kind of near to how the formal notion is used in languages, uh, but yeah, we're, we're making a nice fantasy language anyway. So, um, yeah, um, this for all just says, well, um, uh, it, it, it's still similar to, you know, don't, don't match any further, but it's, it's more like you can, you can use it more specialized, but make sure that somewhere in the code we have actually stated the most general thing, right? So here we could then, you know, we could then actually like use it on the infinite type, but then our compiler would complain if there were a, a type that we could put in here uh, for which the computation wouldn't work, right? So, <coughs> um, uh, yeah, so let's let's look at how, how error messages, messages could look like. In this case, if we just say, well, you know, the head is true for every, you know, for, for all kind of x and y, um, we could put arbitrary x, uh, sort of arbitrary things in x, arbitrary things in y, that is not what we want to do because that's not doing any computation. So, uh, here it says, well, this x needs to be at least of this list type. <coughs> that's the that's just constraint up here. Okay, so let's let's make it a list. Yeah? So um, because if you look up here, we can construct something of a list uh, with this colon notion. Um, 
Now it complains, well, this y is still arbitrary. Yeah? So if we put arbitrary y in here, um, uh, we, uh, we, we get an arbitrary type, but this a is constrained by the type of the list. So we need something that, is, that still stays constrained with the list. And um, yeah, it gives an error, so probably we want to we wanna put the x in there. Um, and now it's almost working. And now it actually like this this for all notion uh, graph. So like it says, well, uh, this now type checks for for this notion, but you said you want it for for all possible lists. And there's still the empty list that we can you know that has this property. What we have never talked about the empty list here. So there's a case missing, and um, yeah, we still have to add this, this case in order for it to work. <coughs> um, Another example, null function. So we have a list, we want to see whether the list is empty or not. Um, now with the boolean, to make things a bit easier. Uh, we use this for all notion now um, uh, to, to actually check that we have all cases, cases in there. So we get an error, you know, empty list is missing. So we have to kind of edit now. Um, there's another problem, uh, or not, not necessarily a problem, depending on what you want to do. But uh, I could write a function like this easily. Eh? Because we only state where well, the output kind of needs to be a boolean, but we have never really said uh, which boolean it is. Now, uh, why, why this is a, is it a proper function? This is not a particularly useful function because it always returns, uh, or like, or predicate, this, all, this always, you know, gives the answer true. Um, and we want to find a way of like, okay, if, if, we wanna, uh, if we not only want to assure that when we put a list in here, we get some boolean, we also want to, for example, ensure that for every boolean, we're also getting a list, which would correspond to the notion of, you know, for every boolean, there's also a list um, that represents it. So there is a list that is actually null, and there is a list that actually is not, not null. Yeah? Um, <coughs> uh, if we add another for all notion, technically that, that, you know, kind of would make sense. The only problem is that um, by, by convention, it's often uh, made that, well, you then not only um, check that that one column uh, holds, or like one column has all the cases, but like you go through all uh, all possible combinations of cases, right? Um, so uh, this one, this one wouldn't type. To, uh, yeah, so it, it would kind of look like this. If you, if you put the for all notion on, on both of them, um, we would make sure that you know this sentence really holds for all combinations um, of things that we that we they put in there, which is not quite what we want, and. Um, uh, I came up with something like like this. Take this with a bit of grain of salt, um, but the technical idea of, of why um, of why uh, this this concept is interesting for the predicates um, is because here I can say well <clears throat> uh, for for all lists there there kind of there kind of has to be any boolean. I don't care which one, but like made for all lists. But also for every boolean there has to be you know a, a certain list um, that uh, that comes from the boolean. And then we kind of get this notion. Um, can someone see uh, why I'm uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, grand salty about this one? So, so what could be the issue depending on how you build your compilers? <clears throat> so the thing is, these constraints we currently say that they all have to hold at the same time, and you know, like, kind of. Like, like a constraint without the for all is kind of weaker than the for all notion uh, because it makes less. But if they both hold at the same time, we might still end up with something like this. Yeah? Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's um, how to how to make these types fine is still a bit of a research topic for um, uh, for for for, uh, for the logical notion. Not my research topic, but like uh, but yeah. So this is like the the, the formulation that we will um, that we will use today. Um, uh, maybe, maybe one question to be honest. Uh, why would we might want to formulate something like this? Oh, you know, we, we get a list and we always get some bool, but also for every bool we get some list. Uh, can can you think of a reason why why something like this would make sense? Um, it's for it's for the direction of reasoning. So <coughs> uh, what we what we saw in the last lecture is that we can use our language in order to reason in arbitrary directions, right? So uh, depending on, on where we put uh, and on where we put our our, um, our arguments, uh, the language can then figure out uh, how to how to complete the argument such that 
uh, it fits for the uh, so yeah that, that, that the statement stays true. And what we do here now is we formulate um, in which directions we guarantee this reasoning to work. So here we guarantee that for all you know lists that we put in here, we get exit, we, we get some value. We don't know how many, but we actually do get some value, and it's it's not the case that um, uh, that there's any list for which this one wouldn't work. Also, the other thing, if we want to use it in, in reverse, so if we want to say, give me a list that is not null, right? In which case, we would set the true here and, and, the, and the variable at the, at the, at the other position. Um, then we kind of need the, the other case. So we want to actually have a list for both true and false and you know, make sure that the reasoning comes up with something. With something right? And uh, with, a, with this double for all notion, we would just make sure that, you know, um, we not only always come up with something, but we always come up with everything. That's the main difference. <coughs> okay. Um, who's still with me? Just, I should check that somewhere. Okay. Kind of, uh, enough, of, uh, uh, enough people still with me. Okay. Let's look at the funny thing. What is the type of null? If we just completely remove the arguments, what, what, what is the type of null? Takes the list of the area. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's actually, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, so this is where, where I kind of want to go. So, um, we kind of want to make sense of, um, if we, you know, if we give all, uh, if we give all arguments already, you know, uh, we write this as constraints, but if we don't give it as arguments, um, you know, uh, th these constraints kind of become part of the type notion. Uh, let's look at some, here, oops, wrong button. Uh, let's look at images of why that makes sense. Now, how we, how we kind of visualize types was, okay, we, we have a thing, yeah, and this thing enforces some kind of meaning, yeah, so some kind of uh, uh, overhanging over oh, yeah, over uh, meaning uh, to constrain its surroundings. And uh, how, we, how we wrote it is uh, as a constraint, saying, okay, well, we have, we have these two variables, and they're constrained uh, kind of in this, in this setting. Now, when we do not have these variables, um, these constraints or the information of the constraints still has to be contained in the type. And <clears throat> uh, yeah, therefore, if we uh, uh, if we have a thing, uh, then then the type is its constraints on its surroundings. Now, <clears throat> uh, this is the this is now the, the overall type. It still fits nicely in there. If we add one argument now, we are not constraining as much of the surrounding anymore. You know, so like some of the constraints have already been met. This is how we put the the x fitting me in there. So <clears throat> if we give a thing its argument, then um, some of the constraints vanish. So uh, this corresponds to having just a smaller hole up here. And now the question is. Um, if we now fill this last hole, which type do we get? Yeah? It's very boring. It's, it's, it's just type. Yeah. So um, uh, in the end, like kind of, kind of, if we if, if there are no constraints whatsoever, it's just called type. When we at this point, uh, funny question that I kind of want to know, uh, want to mention: uh, What's the type of type? Um, it's not type again. Even though it, 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 it feels intuitive, but it's type one. The reason is the type cannot contain itself; otherwise, you will run into paradox. Uh, paradox so, uh, the type of, of type is type one. The type of type one is type two, and so on and so forth. Um, they're called universes. They're quite fun. But yes, so now we have this, this notion of um, having a uh, having a reasonable notion of what to put um, as the type. Of these um, of these tokens, <clears throat> let's look uh, at, at, a, at another example. Essentially, doing the same thing because I want to look a bit at syntax. We will we will see, shortly see that we were running in some syntax uh, issues. So this is the append function. You know, if I append nothing to something, um, <clears throat> it stays to something. Um, and uh, yeah, if I if I append 
a list that actually is different named element, we recursively go through the elements and append them to um, uh, to our recursive argument, our Z, Z. Uh, <clears throat> in the surface of this, it's also clear we can append all combinations of two lists. Huh? Um, and for this, this, this time we, we don't care um, uh, if, if all lists can also be created from other things. <clears throat> um, yeah, this notion as it's written here works, works so, so far so good, but in a nice language we want to make this more of a sentence, you know, this, this looks very commandy and, and yeah, we, don't, we don't want that. So, um, yeah, if we write it nice, we write something like, you know, append one list and another list into some resulting list. The issue with this one is now, though, that um, we now kind of have a type for append that makes sense. Well, what's like the type of this end here now and the into and stuff? Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we have to be a bit more concrete on, on, on how, we, how we put that. Uh, some languages, uh, Akta and Mod, for example, I think, um, they solve it with these so-called infix oper uh, um, uh, mix -fix operators. Sorry, mix -fix operators. Eh? So what they do is um, they still, you know, append and into forms one union. They they put that here, and um, then uh, they they just have underscores where the arguments would go. Uh, this is one way to do it, and. Um, <clears throat> It looks a bit nicer, um, and yeah, you still have like these underscores, so like the the, um, the signature still looks a bit odd. I personally would, uh, I am. If we formulate this in our language, uh, we could say, okay, uh, append x and y into z, and then formulate these constraints, and then have these types constraints. This works, but there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of uh, symbols there, um, and a lot of symbols double. So, uh, one way that would be absolutely nice if we could write something like this, huh? where we just put the constraints of, of, the, of the types at the position where they're supposed to be. <clears throat> now, can you already think of what the problem is for this one? The problem is, uh, we already have some syntax for top-level statements, right? So this, these are essentially like the sentences that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we've written here. Um, so, you know, sentences with, with, with variables and stuff, and uh, it's actually quite important that we can write whatever sentence just comes in our, into our mind here. This, however, is a shortcut for, you know, our, uh, our uh, constraint notion. And there's a problem, how do we distinguish now when we just you know, write that something is true, that some sentence holds, and when something becomes, um, you know, uh, uh, and when something becomes this constraint notion. And, um, yeah, uh, in order to, to, to get rid of this, this ambiguity, um, we're now going to start looking at a short intermezzo. We, we ran over this notion already a few times. Um, yeah, so the last function, you know, it just gives out the last element, but then here we have this weird recursion element, uh, this weird, weird recursion argument, you know. Um, this is why if, if you write pure logical language, I think this is like always the hardest part to, to learn uh, why, why we have to um, kind of write the result double or something. Uh, <coughs> um, it would be way nicer because we know where the, this last argument, um, it, uh, so it would look way nicer if we were to say this thing. It's not only constraining the last argument, but it is treated as if it were that last argument, all right? So this thing would then be, could be treated as, as if it were that last argument, and then we could just, you know, write the, um, uh, write the recursion directly in there. Uh, yeah, same problem here, top level notation. We could technically also just write something specifically that you know works on uh, on the, the last token, the HS token, um, and uh, we, we get conflicting stuff. So like by by this notion, as long as it as we know which which arguments to, to put in there, it's technically fine. But uh, once we mix these concepts, it's get it gets a bit messy. <coughs> and uh, yeah, 
we're taking types to the, res to the rescue. Um, so if we write the type up here, um, uh, or, or like the, the, the type constraints, uh, we can say the, the, the first part needs to be a list, the second part you now needs to be uh, an argument of the list. And now, um, if this were uh, like a full-on predicate, it would just have the type type. But that is too, too arbitrary because the, the A is constrained in the list A, uh, so this one wouldn't type check if that were now just an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary predicate. But if we now treat it as if it were its last argument, uh, this suddenly type checks. Uh, so, so suddenly, <clears throat> suddenly we, we actually know, know what to put in there. And that is one funny idea of how to use, uh, how to use type systems is um, for compilation, uh, not only you know um, check whether like in the current setting that you think uh, it makes sense, it makes sense, but check whether there is a way how to make sense of what we wrote there, right? Because if we explain our compiler what we meant by it, uh, it can just you know search until it finds something that makes sense. We can also ask questions: Is the sense unique uh, or unique enough? So it makes for very nice compiler errors, but the compiler says, well, there, there is like two ways of how I could think about this. Which one do you mean? Right? So this is this is a notion that um, <clears throat> that yeah that, that can give you some some very nice power of ambiguity, and it just makes nicer code because uh, <clears throat> if we oops uh, uh, yeah if, if we look at this one, this one is just way smaller, and we still know what's meant. You know, like the last thing just like recurs this one. You know? Um, and yeah, types can be used uh, to do in to implement that. Doesn't always work, but pretty often. <coughs> okay, um, I kind of want to want to use this notion, and that is um, we we're going a bit more functional now, uh, because this notion looks so nice. Let's see. Okay, um, what kind of language can we make if we assume that this is always the case? So if we always treat things as if they were their last argument. And this is when we get to functional languages. This is pretty much exactly what functional, or like functional languages like Haskell do. Um, so yeah, this is why they have you know, this equal sign to, to like stress a bit more that this thing actually uh, um, uh, becomes this, this notion. Right? Uh, <coughs> so we put that up there. Um, and uh, you know, so this thing becomes the result of this uh, of the um, uh, of the recursive notion, uh, and also we uh, for the type we are adding now uh, some extra symbol. This one, this one just says like we're using an arrow because it kind of indicates the re uh, the direction of reasoning that we're doing. So like you know, these things become something else, and this is why functions have this this nice function type. And something that is often uh, in functional language uh, like. Haskell doesn't do it explicitly, but it can make me do it. But after actually is very strict about this. Um, this for all notion uh, in the function type, we always assume that the left hand side is always a for all thing. So <coughs> yeah, we remove this constraint. We always say like, well, if this is a uh, if this is a total function, it needs to work on all possible inputs. Huh? So um, yeah, on, all, on all possible inputs on your on of your of your program, your function should compute something. <coughs> This is a very neat way of how to make safe software, and this is why also like um, you know these functional languages are so widely used in verification. Um, so um, yeah, functional languages exist already, but they don't inherently have this nice back and forth reasoning mechanism uh, that we had uh, in the last lecture. However, if you actually build tools for these languages, you will see that these tools already contain this this um, you know back and forth searching searching algorithm somewhere. For type checking or something else, and <clears throat> uh, and so yeah, like the, the the only thing that these languages don't produce is you know uh, like so with functions you don't inherently have a search, but um, function languages aren't really far off having having a search structure underneath them. Uh, okay, and now for some examples, what you can do with types. Types are kind of boring if they stay concrete. So if we just you know stay with Integers, chars, strings, whatever, because they really only constrain that you don't, yeah, literally don't put things where where, where they where they don't belong, or like you know you don't, um, you know, try to add a string to an integer or something. Types become more interesting 
Uh, and this is this can be very well expressed in the function of saying uh, with higher order types. So, uh, or, uh, not higher order types, uh, higher order functions, right? So here we have a function that can even take a function as an argument, right? So um, <clears throat> when we have something that actually can, can compute values, we sometimes don't really care for what it's computing, but we can still already express something about the fact that we know it's computing something, right? So uh, yeah, we're getting a thing that computes something. We're getting a list of some uh, some values of some type, and make it another list of another type. Yeah, so um, uh, essentially, we're going through all elements and applying the, the function that we're getting to each element, and then we start from one list, uh, and you know, then then the, all all values in the list change. Can we express this now in predicates? And the answer is a very clear. Ah, ah. Um, so uh, yeah, this is kind of how this looks uh, like in the, in the notion that we, that we had before. So um, what we're saying here in the, in the predicate notion, well, we, we need some kind of predicate um, that for all, <clears throat> or for maybe for all, you know, types produces some some output type. Um, we still get two lists, <clears throat> uh, you know, um, for, 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 for the output. And here we just say, well, whatever this predicate does, we don't care, but like it's placed here and it's getting these two arguments. And then the rest looks the same, you know, we still have here the recursion argument um, and it fits again. Uh, the only problem, like one, one of the problems with this one is um, this works really badly for infix notions because in these infix notions we kind of technically know where to put this p already. So, you know, as this is kind of an infix function, um, this doesn't, you know, directly fit here and you need to write a slightly different map function and that is cumbersome. And this is why. Um, open type systems uh, use this function notation and this mix fix notation uh, because by, for functions we just say like okay we put functions first and then their arguments um, and then you know however the function looks like it's it's dealt with somewhere else right um, <clears throat> so yeah you can technically do that with predicates but it's just easier working with functions um, yeah let's look at a very nice example uh, of when we really we really abuse the type notion. So, <clears throat> uh, in the last lecture, we had something that we can simulate other languages in our language, which made the language really nice. Right? And there exists something very similar for types. And that is okay. Let's let's look. Let's let's think about what would be the type of another language that we have somewhere. Right? Um, the type uh, would probably be okay. It's it's a language. Um, yeah, it's also some some language type. Or whatever, but we we want to interact with it. So there's some kind of input output into the language, <clears throat> and the input uh, it's usually called return. Uh, so the, the input is just it takes some value of some type a and puts it into something that the language can actually deal with, right? Pushes it in there. Um, the reverse of it run I call it run. There's no official thing because this doesn't always work, but. Um, for, for today, you can technically also say, well, if you have a language, like if you compute something in another language, you also kind of want to get the value that the language computed out again, right? So this is this is, in this case a run. Um, it doesn't always exist, but um, uh, yeah, just for the notion. And this one is called bind, and that is just um, uh, this can can make two uh, two parts of, of code, for example, in in some language communicate with each other. So. You know, we first have a thing of a language that produces some value, kind of value A, and if we run that language, we can then pipe that value, um, the value that this, this language produces, into you know uh, another thing of the same uh, of the same language, and then get a language that um, produces some output, but this output is based on on what we put in there, right? Kind of kind of like piping Linux, and <clears throat> uh, if we yeah, so so. Um, uh, for example, here we can have code pieces that communicate with each other. Um, okay, who <clears throat> who kind of has in their head now some 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 language that they that would that, that they would think of um, that we want to communicate with? Um, uh, okay, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, think of like uh, uh, language as as for example uh, commands in in our assembler. Right? Um, so you know all these commands have this this language type. And we, we said, well, the output would be if um, if our, our, uh, our memory pointer points to halt, and we have another pointer that points to where our where our solution is, 
then at this position, position you know, the, the A, with the, the solution pointer would point to something of the type A, and this would be returned. Right? Um, uh, re uh, returning that something, so, so putting something into the, into the language would just mean um, putting something at the position, uh, or like putting something into the memory, you know, uh, it could, be a, uh, could be a command, or just like, you know, it could be some, some value. <clears throat> And um, this bind operator is just like you have two memory states and you operate them after each other. So like you know, the first memory state that takes like the action that it currently has in this memory state changes the memory accordingly, moves the, the program pointer, and that is then that is then the next state. And um, what then the communication in between would be um, is kind of like when we, for example, pull arguments out of out of the memory, right? Um, if we pull an argument out of the memory that some other command put in there in the first place. This is what would be put in here, for example. Huh? There's a lot of, there's, like literally, there's a lot of different lang like languages that we can, that we can uh, uh, talk about like this. Um, but essentially, whatever language you, you want to type, your type will eventually look like this. And um, yeah, I use languages as a, no as a notion, but um, you might have figured these things are called monads. Right? So if you just exchange lang for monad. Um, this is the, the, uh, the type theoretic notion of, of how we do computation, of how we type things in other languages. And uh, now we can even do something something funnier. <clears throat> and uh, let's just take a look at this, how we pronounce this. Um, let's ignore what's here. What we say, for all x that have r of a certain type, and for all operations that take a thing of that type, and you know, give us give another operation in you know our, our monadic language. Um, we say that if we re like first just return this thing and then operate it, it is as if we would operate uh, the, uh, on the value directly. Okay? So this corresponds with that notion of okay, um, <clears throat> you know, the return first put something uh, 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 first write something that makes sense to the language. This thing then just like only like gives that value, and so the next operation would then actually operate on the value that we put in there, right? This is what this one states, and <clears throat> uh, and yeah, so like yeah, so if, if we first do return and then operation, it is as if we would do the operation on the x, and the funny thing is that this is just a type uh, type annotation. Um, uh, that, that you know constrains certain laws to be hold. And if we find an implementation for this one, we have proven that this works. You know? Because as soon as we find an implementation for the left ID, it makes sure that we actually care for all values of type A, we actually care for all uh, for all possible you know operations that we can have, and then for all possible values and all possible operations, this thing has to hold. So uh, you know um, yeah, uh, this, this thing has to hold. Um, same for this one. So if we do some operation and then just return the value, it just stays the operation, right? So um, because you know, return should be something as boring as possible. And some associativity uh, without going into detail. But like these are essentially like the three laws um, that have to hold for monads in order to make this a sensible language in a sense, right? And um, uh, yeah. Okay, we think about monads, and yeah, up here we just have you know normal type annotations, yeah? but types are nothing but formulating constraints on your values, and if you can formulate constraints on your values, we can even kind of abuse this notion as far as possible to constrain our values so much that they even behave the way that we want. Okay, and uh, this is why you know types can also be used for proofs, <coughs> uh, and yeah. You know, types and proofs are essentially uh, the same thing, or they, at least they are isomorphic, um, as a notion, but yeah. Um, uh, this is why, for example, ACTA, this, this looks pretty similar to ACTA already. Uh, this is why ACTA is a programming language and a proof assistant at the same time. <clears throat> um, okay, questions for this one? <laughs> you, you, uh, you look a bit dazzled. Let's wait for a few minutes and the questions will come. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So, uh, but uh, the, the thing is, I just said, in the functional languages, there's usually no inherent notion of a, um, of a search, huh? a research topic, but we formulate a language that can do the search, so maybe 
uh, next time. So next week will be the search chapter, or one of the search chapters. Um, and yeah, maybe we can actually search for proofs. Uh, search uh, for things that makes our programs actually run. Okay, let's do some review. Okay, so types. Uh, so we can um, uh, we can fit the, uh, uh, to, to parts of our sentences, can fit a type. Uh, these types can then constrain certain other parts of our, of our sentence, and um, essentially our code compiles until we find um, something uh, where, where all these parts kind of fit into each other, and that is what makes the type system. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first notion that we had is types just as normal you know, constraints that we can put also like uh, that we can put on, on arbitrary things, only that we mark them specifically. And this uh, gives our compiler a notion to, to tell us when we put things where they don't belong. Now, in order to, um, to actually ensure that we've written enough code such that we're satisfied, um, we have this you know, for all notion. Um, and a funny story, uh, I, I don't know, uh, um, is any of you doing teaching already? Uh, okay, but uh, yeah, they're, they're often like the students are like, you tell them, proof, proof this theorem. And they say like, it works on this example. And then all the mathematicians are like, that, that example is not a proof. Yeah, so like with this for all notion, um, we actually ensure that we're not you know, only dealing with special, special cases, but we're dealing with literally the entirety of what we, what we wanted to constrain. And um, yeah, then we have this, this funny type uh, thingy where we can say, okay, um, types that we don't specifically say, they kind of correspond to this, uh, to this constraint notion. So the type, con uh, the type contains the constraints that are put on the values around it. And in the end, if everything has exactly one type, our code compiles. And that is nice. Um, so yeah. I want you. Yeah, this is this is an interactive play. So uh, yeah, uh, if you if you're building your language, um, you can actually try writing such a type checker. Yeah? So a type checker, like it, it take it takes some some base types and then goes through your sentence and essentially just checks whether the constraints we held uh, over that sentence actually help, uh, hold for the sentence. And you will see that this is um, uh, almost I think almost entirely possible uh, with the computation notion that we had last time. So um, when, when the last time um, you, you built some, some kind of, uh, so this, this term matching algorithm and maybe some, some notion of, of how rules work, and you, you can see that like, then implementing types into your language will be not far off that one. Eh? So try experimenting around this and then you get a bit of a better, better grasp on, on um, you know, why, why we have these type notions. And um, yeah, just one thing. I wasn't sure if I if I should tell this, but like, um, don't directly copy my syntax. So we're building a we're building a fantasy language in here. Um, some of the syntax is inspired by actually languages, but as um, yeah, uh, uh, just like when you build your own languages and you see that, for example, um, that there's some ambiguity that cannot be solved or something. Um, this is still very much possible. So yeah, uh, uh, th this is the learning aspect of it. When you when you see it, you see like all the details that we can go through. Um, and yeah, uh, and only I have one final thing because uh, where we're through the lecture now, I'm the kind of person, I'm the type of person that wants to be asked questions. Thank you very much.